Hello, and welcome to the SAG After Foundation's The Business Program. I am Miata Idoga, and I could not be happier to be with you this evening. Like so many of you, I am an actor. I've been a member of SAG AFTRA for 28 years and equity for almost that long. And I am also the CEO and founder of Abundance Bound. For the past 18 years, we have been passionately providing financial education specifically for actors, artists, and non-traditional earners of all kinds. There you all are. Thank you, each of you, for joining us today. As we shared, everyone, in the description of this event, lots of people, lots of people, want to make money as investors in the stock market and in real estate, but a very small number actually put in the time to start learning how to trade and invest the right way. As each of you are very personally aware, investing presents tremendous opportunities for increasing stability and for actually increasing and building wealth. But it can feel very complex and overwhelming. So what ends up happening is that we think about it, we talk about it, we attend workshops like this one, but a very small percentage of us ever really start doing it. So I want our attendees to know that the four of us spent some time preparing for this conversation, and we have a shared mission. Our goal is that everyone leaves here with actionable information and your next steps to becoming an investor. So just a quick rundown of how we've planned our time together. Each of our guests will start by sharing their stories, who they are, what they're up to in the world, and their personal investing journeys. Then I have some questions that I hope will bring you additional insights. And we also ask that you go ahead and share your own questions in the chat. And we will do our absolute best to answer as many of them as we can. Just some important things to keep in mind as you listen and as you formulate your questions. All investments and investment strategies involve risk of loss, okay? None of us are registered investment advisors. We are here to provide financial education, to give you the opportunity to learn from our personal experiences and insights, but it is not possible for us to know your personal investment objectives, your specific investment goals, your specific needs, or your financial situation. We have each had some very tough lessons some of which we will share with you today that have come largely from failing to do our own due diligence and recognizing that we must all be responsible for making sure that we fully understand our individual financial pictures and our individual risk tolerance before participating in any investment strategy. So with all of that said, let's dive in. And one of the things that we know each of us is so important is our mindset. This is important with everything in life, but particularly when it comes to investing and how you are thinking about your financial relationship. If we wanna talk about someone who has taken action, right? And you went from someone who thought 
investing in the stock market was not for you at all to someone who paid for your 40th birthday trip from your investing money. And so I'd love to ask for you to share your journey and for all those people who are so eager for the, uh, give us some practical, how did you start, Sarah? Um, thank you so much, Miata, for having me on. I feel so blessed to be here. And um, actually, it's really funny just speaking to what I'm not looking at the chat right now, but um, I gave a talk on stocks um, maybe like a month ago. And um, I, in my presentation, like I go through the basics, but it's a lot of information and it can be overwhelming. So I like pause maybe 15 or 20 minutes in for questions and everybody had like a million questions and like, I had to keep going with the presentation. And so I, I stopped the questions and I said, listen, I know you have a lot more questions and this is a process and this topic, like just finances in general, stock market, real estate, anything like having to do with growing your money brings up so many questions because you want to grow your money. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to mention like um, patience is a really important part, um, especially with investing in particular. Um, so I I got into the stock markets by accident. Um, <laughs> I was um, I was an actor and a playwright for 14 years in New York City, and then I guess when I think like tw I turned 36 or 37, I moved to North Carolina and like switched um, professions. Um, and uh, I started making enough money to save. Like in New York, it was paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. Like going to the grocery store was super stressful. And um, so then I, I started, I think I, I just was able to start saving money around maybe 37. Um, and then when I turned 38, um, I had a family member um, want to actually, so she wanted to um, give me some money uh, so generously. And then um, she was going to use that by paying with some of her stocks that she's invest like bought stocks and held since the early nineties. Um, and so she, um, but then she told me she didn't want to pay the get capital gains tax on it. <laughs> so she gave me stocks. So if I wanted the money, I would have to pay the capital gains tax myself. Like when you buy stocks and then you sell them, there's a there's a tax that the government charges you. Um, <laughs> so she didn't want to sell them to give you the money because exactly. then she would be responsible for the capital gains tax. So Correct. she gave them to you as the stocks. <laughs> yes. And gave me the, um, the, the responsibility of choosing to have the capital gains tax or not. And now I didn't realize um, at that time, now I had never, I was allergic to the stock market. And I mean like deadly allergic to the stock market. I thought it was just for people who were really wealthy or came from wealth um, who were just, I did not have any financial tools whatsoever um, when I was given these stocks. So um she connected me with her broker and um, I gave the broker my checking account number because I thought you could put stocks into a checking account. Well, you can't. You have to put them into a brokerage account. <laughs> um, so I literally did not know. I knew zip about stocks. Um, and so then I, I got all these stocks and I was really excited because um, when I opened up my brokerage account initially sort of as like a um, initiation prize or whatever, like to get you to use their brokerage account, you would get like $5 worth of some stock, like a really crappy stock, but you know, you, they give you $5 of whatever. Um, and so I got um, the, I got $5 worth of fuel cell, which is a battery company. <laughs> and um, it 
when I got into the stock market, it stocks were going up. Like it's called a bull run. And they were like in the middle of like this amazing bull run that lasted for a few months. So like the stocks were like climbing. And so um, these uh, fuel cell stocks I got made like they went up like 20 percent in like a week and a half, which is really fast. Um, And I was stunned by how I did nothing and got like a dollar or two or whatever it was. Um, I was fascinated. I thought that was magical. And so then when I got the stocks, um, I was really excited, sold them all. (laughs) And they were really good stocks. So this was mistake number one that I made as a beginner. Um, I sold I sold all of them and then I made, I decided I was going to make buy, you know, things that I wanted to buy. Um, I did, uh, I really didn't do any research at all. So these are all things just for the record that you should not do. (laughs) Um, So I, um, I ended up uh, one uh, mistake I made was I bought this um, electric scooter company, Um, the scooter, it's uh, called Niu. And um, it was right now it's gone down like 60%. I've lost like 60% of my original investment. (laughs) And I'm going to, um, I'm going to share, uh, this story. So no one else has to make this mistake. Um, and today I just want to also say as a disclaimer, I'm very responsible with the companies, um, and funds that I choose to invest in. Um, so, but this was two years ago when I just started, I was a complete, complete newbie. Um, And uh, so I bought $900 worth of these um, stocks. And uh, it was also money that I could afford to lose. And so that's also like another really important practical tip um, when you're investing in stocks. You when you're investing, you want to make sure that this is money you do not need for groceries, you do not need for your rent or your mortgage or your car payment or whatever it is. This is money that you are okay with not touching for five years um, or um, that you're okay with uh, losing 60% of, which is what happened to me with this, (laughs) um, with these shares that I bought. But um, I think the last time I looked um, at them, they were so $900 worth and they're like at $213 now. So that's just like an example of like what can happen um, if you don't do your research, like Lisa was saying. And um, it's great. Like, it's so easy to get like euphoric and you have all these questions and you want to make the money grow magically. Um, And it does magically grow. I mean, it's really incredible um, watching your money grow over time with patience. But um, anyway, uh, if I had done research back then, I would have invested in an an ETF, um, which is like it's an index fund. So I would have gotten um, the like an index fund that tracks the S and P five hundred. Um, it's it's um, an S and P five hundred ETF. Um, and uh, if I had bought that index fund in back then, um, instead of new, uh, nine hundred dollars worth, uh, today it would actually be worth about a thousand dollars instead of two hundred and thirteen dollars. Just for perspective. <laughs> so let's talk about that just for a second, because I'd like to explain the concept of index funds. Because I believe, and I think all of you agree, that index funds can be a really powerful way to get started investing in the stock market. And so index funds, the way that I learned about them, and I've always loved this analogy, they are a basket of stocks, right? Instead of me picking an individual stock, I can go out and I can invest in an entire 
basket. And so, Sarah, you mentioned the S&P 500, and that's something that we all hear about a lot. You hear the S&P is up or the S&P is down. And so the S&P is an example of a basket of 500 stocks, right? And so you, as an investor, Do you do a combination? Someone is asking, what is an EFT? So it's an exchange traded fund, right? It's actually an ETF, an exchange traded fund. And Sarah, isn't it a way that we can it's we can buy ETFs, we can buy shares the same way that I might go buy a share of Coca-Cola, but instead I'm buying a share of a basket, right? Is that a good way of explaining it? Yes, that's perfect. Yeah, so it's, yeah, ETF exchange traded fund. And so um, there are all like the stock exchanges, there are a few different stock exchanges in the United States stock market. Um, So there's the S&P 500, there's the NASDAQ, there's the Russell Williams, there's all kinds of, um, there's several different exchanges. The S&P 500 also, it should be mentioned that it's like the top 500 companies on that exchange Mm -hmm. in the United States. So they're really good companies and they can get kicked off if they don't do well. So for instance, um, I'm pretty sure Adobe is on the S and P 500. Um, and so, uh, something happens with Adobe and the company implodes, it'll get kicked off the, the top 500 and somebody else will come in and take its place. So like, that's why an exchange traded fund is a low risk, um, stock to invest in because it's tracking that index. And like Miata said, it's it's that basket of the top 500 companies. And that will rotate as certain companies maybe fall off of that um, top 500 list. Right. Okay. And so um, there have been a couple of questions that have come through that I think are very specific to the stock market. Um, And what I'd love to do, uh, exchange what fund? An exchange (laughs) traded fund, an ETF. Okay. The S&P is not an exchange. The S&P 500 is an index. So that's a basket, okay? A basket of 500 stocks. However, what I can do is I can buy an ETF, an exchange traded fund that tracks the S and P. So I I want to go out on a limb and say it's called SPY, but do you know, yes, Sarah? It's SPY. It's yeah, SPY yeah, right? it's SPY. Um, yeah, that's um, that's one of two of them. And that one is a really good one to invest in. Yeah. To invest in. Okay, great. Thank you. So what I want to do, because we're getting a lot of questions already that are coming through, but what I want to do is because we also want to talk a bit about real estate, what I'd like to do is ask Elizabeth to share a bit about your story when it comes to investing in real estate. And then again, let me just clarify for all of our guests, what we are going to do is then come back and start going through the questions that you have submitted, okay? So Elizabeth, I, for for me, I made some very big mistakes investing in real estate, some very emotional, oh, I heard about, you know, being able to get inexpensive property in a state that I'd never been to and bought some properties that then ended up being just a major drain on our finances. And I'm so struck by the systematic way that you have approached 
building a real estate portfolio. And I'm hoping that you could tell us a bit about that experience sure. and journey. Sure. Um, and it starts with mindset. I hate to say that, but it does start with mindset. And, um, you know, I, I, I've shared my story before. I was just a struggling broke actor, just like going like, there has to be a different way. Like I can't live paycheck to paycheck and worried about where the rent's coming from. It's just, it was just untenable. And um, I just, I wasn't enjoying my life and I wasn't enjoying my acting career or anything. And I um, came across a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which Lisa had mentioned before. And I, I mean, I know that's a book that a lot of people recommend, but if you talk to nine out of 10 real estate investors, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was their gateway drug into real estate investing. And that book is all about mindset because we were all taught very erroneous messages growing up. I don't know if you guys all know this, but we were taught work hard in school, go to college, go get a job, go buy a house, go buy a car. And before you know it, you're just stuck. You're just, and then you're supposed to retire at 65 years old and you're stuck in that job, you know? And I'm like, there has to be a better way. And what Rich Dad, Poor Dad taught me in essence, the thing that really just struck me was that real wealth does not come from working harder or working, um, getting a higher salary or making more money or booking that job. That is not wealth. Wealth is acquiring assets that throw off income for you in perpetuity. When I learned that, it was like, what? I had never, like, it never occurred to me that way. That if you acquire assets that are going to throw off income, whether you are there or not, whether you're sick or not, whether you're on vacation or not, it will throw off money for you. That is how real wealth is born and um, is made. And um and, you know, it's no coincidence that the richest people in the world, the largest part of their portfolio is, is real estate. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's just like, I'm going to do that. And so, um, so that's how I got into like, and, and, and look, it's not an overnight process. I had to, I had to get myself educated, just like Lisa and Sarah were talking about. You have to get yourself educated on this. For some reason, you know, I, I invest in, in the stock market as well, but real estate was something that was just spoke to me. I was a renter all my life, so I know <laughs> what, it, what it takes to be a landlord. I know what it, what it is to be a renter. I, that, that business model makes sense to me. You pay someone to live somewhere, and that someone makes money off of you living there. Like, it's very simple for me. So, um, and I know, like, investing in real estate sounds like it's, so out of reach for us as actors. It does. I mean, so it does. it's like what? Like people think like, oh, you, Elizabeth, you rent, you know, you invest in real estate. You must be rich. And I'm like, no, I'm an average actor, just like all of you. But I um, just found ways to get into real estate investing that was actually very affordable. And I totally understand. I totally believe anyone here today can do it as well. Um, and so it just started with me like going to seminars. There's millions of meetups in LA that teach you how, you know, you could talk to real estate investors, mom and pop people that are just buying single family homes and renting them out and whatever, and just learning about that, talking to um, a realtor and, and finding out what they know. Um, so I just started going to conferences and stuff. And it was at one of these conferences, I just randomly met this guy who said, you know, Elizabeth, you don't, you don't need 20% down to buy a, buy a property. And I was like, what? Like, I always thought, you had to put 20% down. And in LA, that is undoable. If, if houses are $700,000 in LA, which is like, that's actually below average in LA right now. I don't have $140,000 lying around to put a deposit down on stuff. But like going to these conferences, someone's like, you just need three and a half percent down. And I was like, I could do three and a half percent down. Um, and it's just that like the knowledge, you don't know what you don't know until you start seeking it out. And so this person like, changed my investing life because I was afraid to jump in because I didn't have the money. But three and a half percent down was doable. And my timing happened to be good because it was also um, a crash in the market. Um, we all remember 2008, mm -hmm. 2009. Um, and, you know, this is when this is right when I was starting to learn about this. It wasn't until 2012 that I felt like I was strong enough to actually buy. I, I spent all of 2011 driving all around LA, looking at all these foreclosure places and all these homes and everything. Um, but in 2012, I finally put an offer in on a duplex in um, South LA, right outside of USC. So I knew it was near a university. I knew it would be good. And someone had told me, buy two, buy, don't buy single family homes in LA. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make sense. Buy multifamily. I'm like, oh, why? Because if you buy two properties, uh, if you buy, if buy one property that has two units, you're making income off of both. 
And that is what makes it worthwhile. So, so I was just, I just basically, all I did was go around LA, look at areas that had um, homes that um, were low priced enough in areas where I could charge rent high enough where I could actually make a profit. And that area just happened to be South LA, which was um, where USC was. So I bought my first duplex in 2012. I'm sorry. I want to ask you, sorry, to repeat that again. You looked at areas. You you just gave us a formula that I think is really critical because I'm seeing some folks, and I had this experience where we say we we bombed, we right, but you had a formula. Can you repeat that? So you find properties that are priced in areas that are priced low enough so that, but they, but you are able to command rents in that area that will cover your mortgage interest, your property taxes, your insurance costs, all that stuff that comes with owning a property. And so I'll just give you quick numbers. I think all that, all that, we call it pity, um, property, uh, like principal insurance taxes and um, uh, interest, right? I think mm-hmm. that for a very first property I bought near USC, it all that was like $2,200 a month, but I was able to charge $3,400 in the front and like $1,200 in the back. So I was, I, I far cleared what I needed to pay every month. And so that was just pure income for me. That was just passive income. And then, like I said, it, it's the beauty of it, it's passive. I don't have to be there. I, I could just collect on that every month um, without, you know, without me having to be there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, just long story short, like that worked out so well. The next year I bought another duplex about three blocks away. Um, And they, uh, and then in seven years later in 2019, I sold both of them. They had, both of them had more than doubled in appreciation. So not only was I making money off of the rents every month, I also made money off of depreciation of these properties. And, um, and we had mentioned capital gains taxes. I wanted to avoid capital gain taxes um, because the government will take a lot of that if you sold it and just kept the cash. But there's this thing called a 1031 exchange where you could sell the property as long as you roll it into a bigger property, you don't have to pay any taxes on it um, until, you know, way, way down the road when you, you could just keep on 1031 exchanging until you die. You never have to pay taxes on it. So that's um, kind of what I did. I, I sold both those properties and I bought an eight unit um, apartment building in Long Beach. Um, so that was just one of the examples of stuff I'm doing. In the meantime, I was house hacking. So I was living, I bought a condo in um, right outside of downtown LA I lived in it. Um, and then when I sold it two years later, because I lived in it, I could take all those capital gain taxes without paying taxes, like all those gains I made. And so I took that money and I bought another property and then it, it, it just keeps going. So that's my story in a nutshell. That's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that the best thing for us to do is to start diving into these questions. And what I'm going to do is I am going to try to uh, focus them on the person that I think is probably best suited to answer the particular question. And so we are going to jump a bit between stock market and real estate and mindset and all of those things because we've got questions that are coming through regarding everything, okay? Where I think is a great place to start is a question from Katrina because this is what so many of us want to know. How do I start investing with a small amount? Now, here's what's interesting. Katrina says, say 5K, okay? Now, I just want to say 5K to me when I got started was not a small amount. 5K would have felt like a very, you know, robust amount. But I do believe that a lot of the stuff out there, we see the commercials and it makes us feel like, oh, I I can't, I got to have a lot of money. So I'd like to first start with you, Sarah, and ask with a small amount of money, whether it's I have a few hundred dollars, how would I start? 
Um, you can definitely start with $10. Um, I think like the most important thing is to just start. Um, and so you want to open up a brokerage account, um, like Fidelity or Vanguard are two really great, um, brokerages that I personally recommend. Um, I use Fidelity myself. Um, and then you can, um, you know, link your checking account and put, um, and then just start putting in um, $10 or $5,000 or whatever it is um, into that account. And then there are different um, brokerage accounts that you can get. Like you can just get a regular um, individual brokerage account, or you could do a Roth IRA. Um, you know, if you're a self-employed, you can do your own 401k um, and, but once, and also this is important, not everybody knows this, but once you put the money into the brokerage account, you actually have to go in and buy the stock that you want to buy. Okay. And tied to this, because you mentioned Fidelity, which I know has like an incredibly robust learning platform that is totally free. But one of the things that I've seen go through a few times is what are your thoughts about Robinhood? And could you share your particular thoughts and experience with Robinhood? Um, yeah, I'll just speak for myself. I do not like Robinhood. Um, that was actually the brokerage account that I originally started with. Um, that that was the account that gave me, you know, the, the five dollars worth of fuel cell. But um Robinhood, uh, basically, I'm not sure if they still do this today, but when I originally had my account, um, whenever you would buy a stock or sell a stock, they would, you know, they send you a message confirming the trade, but um, they would send it with emojis um, and they made investing an emotional experience. Um, and that's the part where mindset is super important. Um, you cannot make well, I'll speak for myself. I cannot, and I don't think any investor should ever make an emotional decision on when you're buying and investing your money that you can absolutely lose. Um, and, you know, it needs to be backed up with research. You need to know what you're buying. Um, and so that was a big red flag to me um, with Robinhood. Um, and uh, also, you have to pay for, I think it's like a gold membership to have access to their research library. Um, and I got a free trial, I think, with that. And so I was I was using it when I was able to access it for free. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, they had some bad news. Um, I think they had a data breach. This was I forget when it was like maybe in 2021. Um, but uh, I just wanted to move my funds into a different um, brokerage account. Um, I wanted to get out of Robinhood, um, especially just I didn't I really didn't respect them using the emojis. And so um, that's when I moved to Fidelity and then I got to Fidelity and they have like this gigantic research library where you can look up all of the company's balance sheets that you might want to invest in. You can look at their cash flow. You can you can see just so much stuff. They have so many articles um, to educate yourself about investing um, literally on any topic. Um, and so uh, I'm really glad that I switched over to Fidelity and, and they don't send emojis. It's just a really plain interface. Um, it's, it's very business, mm -hmm. you know, which I like when I'm investing, I like to keep it business because that's what I'm investing in. You're actually buying real businesses um, that can be successful or fail. Um, so I just, I, I prefer them. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I think, you know, the key thing that I want to really stress for everyone um, attending today is that investing really does have a way of tapping into the emotional sides of all of us. And um, what I appreciated in terms of your thoughts about Robin Hood is just that they play into that. And so you just want to be aware 
that you are seeking to be someone who invests from a place of clarity rather than a place of like excitement and emotion. So we knew we would get this question and I really throw this out to anyone who'd like to address it. Do any of our panelists invest in cryptocurrencies? No, Sarah, do you have any crypto? Um, yes, I had crypto, but I decided to um, exit my positions um, with crypto. Okay. And so um, the this follow-up question was, if so, what recommendations do they have for investing in crypto? And so no one would be able to give you personal recommendations about investing in crypto. If not, what are their thoughts on crypto investing? And so... I'm going to share my thoughts on crypto investing, which is very much tied to my thoughts on investing in general. As we stated when we started, investing, obviously, there is always a risk of loss. But diversification, when you invest, which means that you are investing in a variety of ways, is one of the ways that you protect yourself. As you learn, and hopefully because you're here today, you are choosing to begin or continue your education around investing, what you will find is that there are lower risk strategies, mid risk strategies, and high risk strategies. Cryptocurrency, is an extremely high risk investment. And what that means is that when you look at the money that you have available to invest, a very small percentage of that money should be in high risk investments. So if we go back to our um, Katrina, who said, what's the best way to start investing with a small amount? But Katrina said $5,000. What I would want Katrina to do, if it were $5,000, is I would want Katrina to really assess your risk tolerance, to assess your time horizon for when you would need this money or want this money to be available to you. And then if Katrina were thinking about crypto, I would say tops 5% of that $5,000. Tops. So 10% would be 500. $250 of that $5,000 would be 5%. And that would be the kind of amount that our opinions, right, as a panel, are that you would consider putting in high risk investments like crypto. One of the things that was really our goal today is to make sure that we are all differentiating between investing and gambling. And those are very, very different things. I have been guilty of what I called investing that I absolutely am clear was gambling because I wasn't willing to put in the time to understand and I was looking, let's just be honest, I was looking for the big win, okay? So obviously, because we don't have direct experience, you can take what we say, um, however it resonates for you. So um, Chris says, and I think a lot of us can connect to this, I struggle when I have extra money when trying to decide whether to invest in myself as a performer, to increase my skills, take more classes that make me more marketable, or to invest in my retirement stock market with that money. I'd love to throw this question to you, Lisa, as 
I was hoping yeah. that you would say that. Right. <laughs> um, that is such, this is all part of that sort of the beginnings of building the systems and the foundation in place. Because just because I saved money on the side and, and let that accrue before um, building real estate, I mean, before buying real estate and before investing in the stock market, I had to split those up. And part of what the program that I went through, which is Abundance Bound, um, and that is not a sales pitch just to say this is the thing that changed it for me is that that structure in place happened. I started to put some money to my taxes. I started to put money aside for workshops and and um, and wardrobe and anything that I needed for my marketing of, as being an actor. I had to put aside money for investing. And here's the thing. This is the thing about mindset is that we cannot consume everything at once. It won't happen and it is not sustainable. So when I talked about meeting Liz five years ago, I was like, I want to know everything. I want to buy a house today. I want to know. And it never worked because it wasn't the right time. I had to learn the stuff. I had to do the research. I had to save the money. That alone takes time. Before I went into real estate, um, I wanted, I mean, before I went into the stock market, I wanted it all. I even said to Fidelity, I want aggressive investing. He's like, take it slow. And that's the thing about mindset. But building these little sort of like uh, uh, accounts in different banks or, or different accounts within the same bank is how you make it sustainable so that in time I will invest. In time I will do all these things, but I'm also living and working as an actor now. Thank you. And Liz, as a follow-up question to that, because a number of tied up questions that are coming through is, People just feeling like, well, but how do we, you have to have a lot of money to start investing in real estate. That certainly feels like it's very true in the Southern California or the New York market. But would you say that that's a deal breaker? In other words, I'm seeing a lot of like, well, so I can't, I can't do it. What would you say about the person who's interested in real estate? How do they go about that process of building to the place where they can actually start? Well, I just want to say that I was there. You know, when I was looking at property, you know, when I first started thinking about this, real estate was an all-time high. And I was just like, I can't do it. It's 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 totally outside of my realm of possibility. Um, and then um, and then, you know, things change. The market corrected itself and People are saying there might be a correction soon, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there there are ways like I, I had mentioned before, if you live in the place, you can put three and a half percent down. You know, there, there are all these strategies that you can do it. You could, like I said, you know, get a place and rent out you know, rooms in it. That's called house hacking. Um, you know, buy a duplex, live in one side, rent out the other to help with the mortgage. Um, there's all these other strategies that you can do. Um, and another one that I'm looking, because California and New York are so insane, is look into investing out of state. And um, um, and that sounds a little um, scary to some people, but I've done it. Um, people I've known have done it and have done it successfully. Um, so the thing about California and New York is those, that property appreciates. And that's where most people make their money if they're investing in California. And if you invest in the South, in the Southeast right now, it's very hot, but in the Midwest, their, their properties don't appreciate as much as they do in California or New York, but they, um, they're cheaper and they will get, give you more cash flow. So mm -hmm. if you're investing for cash flow, maybe you want to look into like, I know um, there are people in Indian, you know, Indianapolis is a hot market, you know, where homes there literally are $60,000 and you're making $300 a month just renting them out. Um, you could do that. Um, if you want a, a market that has a little bit of both, Atlanta, we've mentioned it several times, is a great market. Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, those are great markets as well. Um, I think Nashville is supposed to be really good as well, that has as a mixture of both appreciation and cash flow. So, if California is, I'm not investing in California right now. Um, if, if it's not doable, look into, you know, where, where's your hometown? Did you come from Ohio? Ohio is a great, I have, I have a friend that owns six homes in Cleveland, Ohio, and he has like a full-time, he's not an actor, but he has a full-time day job and he barely manages it. Um, and, you know, he was able to buy because 
Cleveland is, was in his backyard. He knew it very well. So there are other ways to get into, you know, if, if California is, is, it is a little insane right now. I got in at a good time. I got mm -hmm. in in 2012, 2013. So that was a good time. But, you know, I, I bought as recently as 2020 in, like, um, in, in San Fernando Valley. I bought a property in, in the Valley there um, and it was 2020. And I closed on March 27th, 2020, right when the pandemic hit. And I was like, what, like, what am I doing? What am I doing? But it's the property still making money and it's appreciated 250,000 since then. So, you know, I do believe you can make money in any market. Just look into the markets that make more, that, that are more comfortable for you. I was lucky when I started, but those deals are still, you're still able to have those deals. If you look outside of, you know, go back to your hometown, wherever, um, you'll, you'll be able to find them. Great. Thank you. Now, can someone invest with a low credit score? You're asking me. Well, it's, um, this is one that I think there question. are multiple different answers. So in terms of real estate, what would your answer to that be? No. Unfortunately, they, right now, lending practices are so tight that you do have to have a good credit score. But I wouldn't let that discourage you. You can see, uh, I've been able to purchase properties because I've gotten um, co-signers on it. Like my brother has helped me, like friends, you know, like they, um, if you have like a family member or a loved one or a spouse or whatever who, you know, has a good credit score and might have not the ups and downs of, of acting income that we're used to, they might be able to co-sign with you you know, if you're good for it and they trust you, you know, those are, there are other really creative ways to put, to get to own property that way. So if you don't have that great code score, look to see if, you know, somebody's willing to partner with you to do that. Um, I've been able to do that. And this would be a very totally different answer, I suspect from you, Sarah. Does our credit score matter at all when we're investing in the stock market? No, it's, you're just investing your own money, like your cash on hand that you have um, in different uh, businesses or funds, whatever you choose to do, but you don't need a um, credit score to open up a brokerage account. So again, my, my personal experience and thoughts the smaller amounts of money or when our credit scores might not be very strong, starting your investing journey in the stock market is probably a better, um, a better place to start. Now, one of the things though, that I believe these questions, these kinds of questions bring up really is the, what work did you have to do in terms of your own finances, and, and um, Lisa, you really shared quite a bit about this when in, during your time, because I really want to stress that investing is not something that can be done until we have clarity about our personal financial position right? We have to know what our numbers are. We have to know what money we're able to allocate to actually building. Um, Sarah, you spoke to this cannot be money that you need to pay your rent. So um, Lisa, you shared a lot about this, but Sarah, can you tell us a bit about the work that you do to ensure that your position is solid? Because you came to investing after a very precarious financial time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, I mean, now I'm super clear on my finances and what my number is every month that I can invest that amount of money. And that is money that I'm not going to touch for like five years, 10 years, tw you know, 20, uh, till I'm 59 and a half. 
um, at when I can start taking out um, money from my retirement accounts. But um, you just, well, for me, um, I got, I did my budget. I found out how much money I have coming in every month. I found out how much my, like to the penny, how much money was going towards rent, um, car insurance, whatever it was, your cell phone bill. Um, and then I looked at the surplus. Um, and in addition to investing though, I also have like a savings account that I put money aside for um, emergencies. And that's actually more important to me than the investing. Um, so then after that, I whatever money I have left over goes um, into into like any any one of my um, accounts that I can use to invest. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. So it is critical that we establish a level of stability before we're going to be able to begin our investing journey. A question came through. I have a particular opinion about this. Should you pay off your credit card before you start investing? And so I'm very curious, did any of our panelists have any debt when you began your investing journey? Yes, Sarah. Um, I had debt and I chose to pay off. I made a plan on the timeline. I was comfortable with paying off my credit card debt. And at the same time, I was also investing. That worked for me. Um, You know, you might whoever asked that question might want to pay off the credit card first. Um, But I did the math and um, I felt that it would be more lucrative for me to also invest while paying off that credit card because of the interest rate that I had. So if you do the math and figure out like how much money you're going to lose by paying off that credit card, you know, in the timeline that you have, um, you know, that that was the decision I made. That you made. Yeah. How about you, Elizabeth? I uh, was not in debt when I started investing, but I had been in debt before. And it was a lesson that you, Miata, taught me years ago was um, even if you're in debt, still save. So save and pay off your debt. Because if you are throwing all your money towards your credit card debt and then something happens, your car blows up or whatever, you're going back into debt again because you have no savings. But if you do both, that is the quickest way to get out of debt. And that's exactly what I did and got me out of credit card debt immediately. So yeah. thank you for that, Miata. Sure. How about you, Lisa? Um, I didn't have debt, but I did believe in these sort of like big expenses that took a lot of my savings out. And I was like, ah, my livelihood savings is like really dwindling. And I didn't stop uh, putting money into my stock market or putting money into my real estate savings account. I did simultaneous. And that's what Miata taught me as well, is that doing both will get you out of it. And it is that sort of these tiny little steps moving you forward. Yeah. So I absolutely uh, still had debt <laughs> when I started my investing journey. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I uh, when I began my financial journey, I uh, was over $80,000 in credit card debt. Um, and so I believe very strongly that yes, there is math that demonstrates that if you pay off your credit cards first, right, that you are saving money. But if we look at America, the reality is that that advice does not seem to be working because the vast majority of people are neither saving nor investing. So what I say is that we absolutely have to have a plan to pay off the debt we will prioritize the debt, but not at the total uh, ignoring of also building some wealth, okay? Six months enough for savings before investing. I 
Um, I think, Nancy Joe, that if you have six months of living expenses in place, you are so ready to start investing. But I would also say that you can start investing before you have six months, okay? The key is to have a plan in terms of all of the buckets that you are building. One of the questions that I think is really important that we get to is your favorite resources, right? Your favorite resources for people who want to go deeper, books, podcasts, what are your favorite resources? Absolutely do not say abundance bound because people in the chat will go nuts. So um, books, podcasts, free resources, free. What have we got? Um, I'll start. Um, I already mentioned mine, which was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That is a classic book. It was written in the 80s. So it might be a little bit outdated right now. But it's by Robert Kiyosaki. He's kind of a blowhard. Um, he's, he's an old school dude. Um, but the concepts really, that book changed my life. It literally changed my life. Um, I was flat broke when I picked up that book. I had no idea how I was going to get into real estate investing and it happened. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. And that's number one. Uh, number two, if real estate investing is of interest to you, um, do what I did, which was just go to conferences, go to, go to, there's meetups all around LA when I was in LA. So many, I would just go and like meet people and talk to people because you don't know what you don't know until you go to these things and you start learning stuff from people and um, all these strategies. There's millions of ways to make money in real estate. My strategy is buy and hold, which is buy a property, hold it, make it money off it. But there are people who flip, there are people who wholesale, there are people who um, syndicate. There's so many things I learned just by going to these seminars. Um, a great resource for all beginning um, real estate investors is biggerpockets.com. That's a website, it's a forum, but it's also a podcast. Um, and the guy that that um, is doing, uh, that hosts it is just very, talks about just mom and pop investors. These are not rich people. These are not conglomerates. These are mom and pop investors, just like you and I. Okay. And you said, because people are saying, what are those conferences, but meetups basically, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know whether since the pandemic now ones are happening online or. They're actually going back in person. Um, I know are. in LA, there's a very active group called Phoebe, F-I-B-I -I, called, and that stands for for investors by investors. They always have really good seminars. I met um, the realtor that got me into the apartment building in Long Beach at one of these meeting meetups. So they really are productive. Fabulous. Fabulous. Lisa, what about you, your top resources? Um, I want to start from the foundation part. So the two books that changed my life is It's Not Your Money by Tosha Silva. Um, I am the type of person who runs in, like I run, I've I run off the cliff without really thinking things through. And there is this anxiety about being late and not having this on time already. And why didn't I have it? And these to uh, Tosha Silva and A Happy Pocket Full of Money are two books to just set the groundwork. Because if you do not set the groundwork, there is no sustainability. Um, these The mindset that I got from these books also changed the mindset that I had with acting. And I told Miata that uh, four years ago when I was starting my financial wellness and cleaning up shop. I was a co-star with no name um, characters on television. And four years later, during a pandemic, I am now being pinned for series regulars. I've booked two uh, recurring guest stars in the last two years. And the pandemic has done a surcharge, I mean, like a surplus of work coming through. So it has everything to do with mindset. It has everything to do with these two books just, just changed my life. It was surrendering to the process and taking action steps that didn't overwhelm or cause anxiety. Wonderful. Thank you. And Sarah, how about you, your favorite resources? 
Um, well, A Beginner's Guide to the Stock Market by Matthew Cratter. Um, that's a really great book. Um, it'll give you a super solid foundation in the stock markets. Um, and then also what Lisa said, actually, because um, I think mindset for me is really important as an investor um, and a happy pocket full of money. Um, and uh, it also, It's Not Your Money by Tosha Silver. Um, those are two. And then... Um, Two other resources are, uh, well, I have to recommend the Fidelity Research Library, but I don't know if you can access that if you're not a customer. However, there is an equally wonderful um, library called investopedia.com. Um, and it has every article that you will ever need to know um, about the stock market. And then um, I follow this investor on Twitter. His name is Brian Feraldi. Um, it's at Brian Feraldi. Um, and that's D-I at the end. Um, and he just gives, I think it's like once a day, he just gives a tip about investing. Um, and it is a lot of mindset. I'll warn everybody. Um, but, uh, that, that I've found is a critical part of investing because you might have a stock that is a really solid company, but then it goes down like 10% or 15% right now. Um, we're having a very serious correction in the markets. So, um, you have to hold, through those times when your portfolio might be red instead of green. Um, and so he just gives a lot of really great tips on having perspective about um, being patient with the markets. So um, here's a question. I'm always finding it difficult to pull the trigger because of my inconsistent paychecks. Payments come in chunks for me, right? So Starting is tough. And how can I grow my current portfolio? All of us here, with the exception of you, Sarah, are inconsistent earners. And so I'm wondering, um, particularly Lisa and Elizabeth, how do you handle continuing to invest with all the ups and downs of your earnings. Do you want to go, Liz? <laughs> um, I, I'm going to go back to Abundance Bound. So I learned systems in this course. I maintain those systems. Um, those systems um, allow for the freedom of the flexibility of income coming and dry spells. Um, it is. Uh, it causes so much more uh, confidence knowing that there's going to be those ups and downs and this is what happens and putting away certain money uh, into accounts, tax accounts to save money for taxes. My S-Corp, oh my gosh, my accountants, I have incredible accountants now, um, they cost money, the 1099s, the W-10s, all this stuff that I need to prepare in the long run, having this information. Um, uh, and abundance bound also on a friday we have these q a's so i bring in oh my gosh there's a month where I've, this happened or huge expense here and the tips and tricks that we're being able to absorb um on a weekly or monthly basis is another way to just keep those systems up leveled and updated but it starts with systems systems are tiny actions that you do on a regular basis that causes an increase in confidence and increase in belief that you can keep going yeah no i was just gonna say kevin i I, I really want to stress the systems piece, right? Where you want to start to get a picture of what's happening over time so that you can slowly increase your confidence in what amount is really available to you to invest. But yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Elizabeth. I was just going to piggyback on what Lisa said was um, the, the, um, the JAR system, which we learned about is um, that has what stabilized my ups and downs so much is, you know, you, I opened up five ally bank accounts and one was like vacation fund, one was investment fund, one was rainy day fund, one was long-term savings fund. And anytime I got a paycheck and sometimes they were big, I just throw money into them. I thought, and then those times when I wasn't making very much, 
I, you know, I didn't throw money into it. And there were times when I had to take money out of those to live. Yeah. Right. So, right. but, but the fact that I had this muscle of just anytime I had money, throw it into those five accounts, split them up hundred dollars here, $200 there. Before you know it, you've got several thousand dollars in this, in this ally bank account. And that knowing that that money is there just stabilizes your emotions and stabilizes your fear around your finances going up and down. So that's what smoothed it out for me. And then, and then like my investment account, oh, I have $3,000 in it. Okay. Let me buy some stocks or buy some index funds with that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think um, for me, I can also say that I, I set up my separate accounts. Um, Capital One 360 is where mine are, but I have all my different buckets. And um, I will admit that I will put money into the investing bucket and I tend to wait until the end of the year to invest from my investing bucket, because that's when I feel confident that that is really what that bucket is for. Right. Yes. Sorry, Elizabeth. And you just reminded me of something else. Set up automatic p- pulling out of your account. That yes. we a lot of times think that we have less money than we do. So um, like I, I have it set up that, Every month on the 22nd of the month, Vanguard pulls out $500 from my account and throws it into my Roth IRA. And there are times where like, there's no way I'm going to come up with that $500, but I do, but I do. So pay yourself first. We all have heard that before, but it really does work. When you have automatic money coming out of your account, you will find a way to make it like, look, if you can make your car payments every month, you can make a payment to your Roth IRA every month. Um, setting it up automatically just makes it happen for you. If that helps. Perfect. It absolutely does. And just to follow up with you, because I think there were a number of questions about this. How did you manage, how do you manage the responsibilities of being a landlord? Okay. Real estate investing is very rewarding, but it also comes with heartaches too, right? And so does an acting career. It is all part of a job. So yes, there are times when, yeah, would I not want a a tenant, like when I'm about to leave for Vegas, tell me that the water heater's broken, that has happened. Or when it's like, you know, raining and they're telling me the roof is leaking, that has happened. But you deal with it. You deal with it. And, you know, you look up on Yelp and you find the best plumber in the area. Are you available to go there? Um, They go, they fix the problem and you Venmo with them the money. Um, And then before long, you start having a Rolodex of like the good service providers in your area. Um, And, um, and yeah, it it is, it's not, it's not pleasant, but it doesn't happen all that often. It really, I mean, everyone's so afraid that every weekend they're going to get, but it really doesn't happen all that often. And in the end, when your property has doubled in appreciation, it is kind of worth it. Like it's okay. You know, I'm okay Mm -hmm. putting up with those, that, that, um, that heartache. Now, You could also get a property manager. Like my eight unit in Long Beach, that's just too big for me to take care of. So I have a property manager. I pay him 5.5% of my gross income to do that. And I'm fine with that. Um, So if you want to do that, um, totally go with a property manager. Just know your property manager will never take care of your place as well as you're going to take care of it yourself. And you should always manage it for at least the first year. So you learn, just like we're talking about, you learn, you learn how much does it really cost to to, to um, replace a um, sink disposal, like a, you know, a trash disposal. How, you know, like how much does it really cost to like, you know, replace the toilet, you know, that kind of stuff. So you learn so that you are educated in the future when you hand over the responsibilities to somebody else. Great. Great. Thank you. Yes. I, we own a, a rental um, that I absolutely managed myself right down to doing the housekeeping myself for the first year. And it was hard, but it was really, really important to understand what was happening. So I I appreciate that advice. Tom is wondering how to invest consciously. And I think, you know, Sarah, I don't know whether you can speak to that in terms of the stock market or any of our guests, um, do any of you have any 
advice about how to invest if consciously? Um, can I just say that last year, this is a this is the biggest lesson of my life. Last year, I put into Fidelity fifteen thousand dollars. I I tried to move back whatever point Fidelity. I left and I just left it there. And um, there's something to be said about hiring your weakness. And the hiring of your weakness doesn't have to be these exorbitant amount of people with really like oh I have a lot of money I'm going to hire somebody. There's so many tiers in which you can get help. And I I actually hired my weakness, AKA Sarah Schaefer. And I was like, oh my God, I have this money. Nothing's been happening to it. And she said, well, you haven't put, you haven't invested. You just have it in the account. And it was this huge wake up call. And mind you, my partner also did the same with way more money and his interest for 2021 on an, on a big amount of money was 89 cents. And I went, oh my God, how do you do this when I don't want to be a stock market guru? I don't want to be a real estate guru. I want to be a working actor. So sometimes you have to hire your your weakness. I say this with Abundance Bound as a membership. Somebody was asking about it. I am not here to, there's no kickback. I tell you it has changed my life. I have to pay that membership and it literally gives me dividends on the amount of knowledge I'm getting from it. Sarah Schaefer, I hired my weakness. I said, how do I do this aggressively? Because in my mind, I wanna work a little bit faster. I'm a little bit older. I'm getting at the game a little bit older and I need to get guidance from someone who knows. But that was a big wake up call for me is that I had all this money in the bank there and nothing was happening with it. Thank you for that, Lisa. I think Tom may also, because I, there are different levels of consciousness in terms of paying attention and having focus. And Tom may also be wondering about investing in things that you believe in that aren't destroying our planet, that aren't corrupting the world. Um, I I am a big fan of um, you can really look for, again, those baskets that are, there are green baskets. There are baskets that have particular focuses. I don't know if that's a word, but particular focuses in terms of the change that they are seeking to create in the world. What you want to be aware of is that the more narrow that you invest, the less diversified you are, and thus the more risk that you're taking on. So you simply want to be aware of how do you balance your portfolio to be sure that it includes things that you believe in, but that also you've created that balance so that you, um, you know, your, your portfolio is strong in terms of how it's diversified. That makes sense. Perfect. Yeah, um, Perfect. and I guess there's it's it's hard for me to talk about that socially consciousness as a as a landlord because I'm not putting money towards like you know the stock. I think that's probably more of a question for Sarah. But I want us to say. Um, I am a very conscious landlord. I'm very kind. I'm not there to screw my tenants over. I am there to provide them with a very safe home that they are happy in. And if they have problems, I'm happy to talk to them. I fix problems. Like it's my, my way of being social conscious, I guess, with my investments is I'm treating my tenants kindly. And I, 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 respond to their um, requests immediately. I'm very fair. I don't raise the rents every month, every year. You know, like I, that's kind of how, like my goal is to make them have a home that they are happy and safe in. And that's I'm not there to screw them over. That's my consciousness. But Sarah could probably talk more to like investing in, in conscious companies. Yeah, they, um, there's something called um, ESG uh, investing. And there's like some ETFs that like Miata was talking about. Um, it stands for environmental, social and governance. And so they're like socially con conscious companies. Um, the one thing I would warn is that you want to review the ETF, um, the ESG ETF that you're investing in, because they might put a company in there that is not actually socially conscious. And another thing I did when I was thinking about doing that, actually, um, so uh, politicians have to publicly uh, disclose what they invest in. And I actually looked up politicians who um, 
whose values were aligned with my values. And I, I looked at what they invested in. So that's something else um, that I, I, that was a long time ago. So I, if you just Google, um, you can find out where it might be on the FEC website, um, fec.gov, but, um, and it might not be, so I'm sorry if it's not, but um, uh, you can find out um, where, what assets they hold um, and invest that way as well. Perfect. So I am, I know I'm over time, but I am going to close with Romy's question. This will be the absolute last question. Um, but it's a, it's a really great one, I think, to close on. Please, do you have anything to add about starting now amidst an almost world war and a pandemic? I'm so confused about beginning in this climate. And that just really, it touches my heart because I feel so strongly that, oh, the world is not, it's just, it's certainly not getting easier, right? And there's so much turmoil. And yet here we are, saying, invest. And so very briefly, I'd like to ask you each, what would your message be to Romy and everybody about that? Lisa, you first. Oh my gosh, I saw that and I was like, yes, let's address this. Um, clarity, absolute clarity clarity about your numbers, clarity about your income, clarity about your expenses, accountability, people who can support and champion you so that you know that you're being lifted on a regular basis. I know things are scary right now. The interest rate now actually is lower than it was years ago. So like there's so many ways you can see these things. The market right now, the stock market, things are like the prices are going down. People are scared. They're selling. It's actually some of these these safer investments are easier to get now with um, cheaper prices like there's so many wins to all the losses and so if anything before jumping in like i tend to do start with clarity in every aspect of your finances and that will take a little bit at first but it will propel you later thank you sarah how about you yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for the stock markets, um, a lot of people have a lot of fear um, with the stock markets because so much is, um, you know, up in the air right now in the world. Um, but again, I would just go back to basics and find that number of whatever you can afford to invest and just automate those um payments into your brokerage account, like even if it's $10 a month, just treat it like a bill um, and then uh, invest, um, invest in something that's low risk, like a, like an, um, an ET, like the S and P 500 ETF, that's really low risk. And if you hold that for 10 or 20 years, um, this, the stock markets will correct themselves. It might take a couple of years. We could about, um, we might experience a recession, um, shortly. I, nobody can predict the future. Um, but I do know that it'll start going back up eventually. Um, and, uh, so I, I would say just invest, you can do the, um, just investing once a month or once every quarter, um, just buy the ETF, just buy the ETF again, four months, you know, three months later. And, and that's sort of um, the easiest way to start. And Liz, how about you? Yeah, um, I, um, you know, real estate's a little less liquid than, than stock market, right? So you're, it, yeah. you're going in, but I think that's also a good thing because um, never get into an investment without knowing the, your exit strategy. So every time I buy a property, I know exactly what my exit strategy is. So if I was to start investing in real estate now in the midst of all this uncertainty and in the midst of all this interest rate, I would make sure that even if it all goes to pot next year, I can still hold on to that property, meaning that I know that that property 
is going to still generate me the income that I could pay off my mortgage so that I'm not going to start defaulting on the mortgage. So if, if I see a property that is allowing me to do that, so I can hold on to this and ride this wave out because eventually it's going to turn around again. That's just what life is, right? It's going to go down. It's going to go back up. If I could ride the low wave out and keep on going, I will. So really like, like everyone's been saying clarity, know what your exit strategy is before you get in know what your plan is. Should it all go to pot tomorrow? What would you do? Like never put yourself in a position where you're so overstretched that a little something is just going to throw your entire, like put you into bankruptcy. That's not the investment for you. But if you could find something that would work even with a downturn and you're still able to hold on to it and you don't have to sell, you don't have to go into foreclosure, you don't have to go into short sale, then it might be worth it because in the end, it's always going to go back up. Wonderful. You guys... Thank you. Thank you, each of you, for giving your time. Um, really, on behalf of the SAG AFTRA Foundation, your willingness to share your experiences and your insights with your fellow performers and your fellow creatives is so very much appreciated.